Hello, my name is Chris Butch. I'm a research scientist with Blue Marble Space Institute of Science, the Earth Life Science Institute, and Emory University. And today I'm going to talk about the role of phosphate in biochemistry and questions of phosphate in the origin of life. So, what's special about phosphate? In order to begin to answer that question, we need to talk a little bit about the roles of phosphate in biology. And it turns out that phosphate is used across biology in a ton of different ways. There's structural elements to its chemistry, there's physical chemical elements, and there's just normal reactive chemical elements. And so we're going to go over those and then talk a bit about how this poses a problem in terms of origin of life chemistry. The first of these roles of phosphate, and perhaps the most important, is the structural role that phosphate plays in the backbone of nucleic acids. So all RNA and DNA, all of your genetic material, is linked by what is known as a phosphodiester bond. And the reason for this uh, is rooted in a few properties of phosphate related to the negative charge that it imparts on the backbone. The first of these properties is that this negative charge repels negatively charged nucleophiles, uh, molecules that would react and break this phosphodiester bond. And because of this, this phosphodiester bond is very stable under physiological conditions. Uh, RNA bonds can last months or years. DNA bonds can last hundreds of years under neutral conditions. The second element of this that's important is that because of that negative charge, it actually means that the reactivity is tunable. So if you need to react and break this phosphodiester bond, uh, all that biochemistry has to do is position it next to some positively charged element often a positively charged metal atom. And then that repulsion is lessened, allowing the nucleophile to attack and break the bond, as I've shown here. This is also how nucleic acids are synthesized. The incoming nucleic acid is positioned next to a metal center, which allows the nucleic acid polymer to react with it and elongate, adding to the strand. Once the strands are formed, this negative charge also has an important role in the structure of RNA and DNA duplexes. So it turns out that on either backbone, when you have two strands coming together, uh, the phosphates adjacent to one another repel each other, uh, helping to keep the duplex more linear. And the phosphates across from each other repel each other. And these combined repulsions are important in keeping the nucleic acid strands soluble and keeping them from just collapsing in on themselves in a way that would be very difficult to work with. And so by having these repulsive charges, it preserves the linearity of these molecules, making them more easy to process through enzymatic reactions. The second structural role of phosphate in biology is in phospholipid bilayers. So the important characteristics of these for the moment are that they have this oily hydrophobic portion um, that is just typically uh, alkane or alkene, and a hydrophilic portion which incorporates a phosphate and usually a positively charged element. And because of this split hydrophilic and hydrophobic behavior, uh, these phospholipids have a tendency to form two-dimensional structures which form the outer membrane of your cells. They line up with the uh, charged portion being exposed either to the exterior or interior water portion of the cell or the extracellular membrane or extracellular matrix. And then the interior comes together forming this oily middle layer. Zooming out a bit, here instead of the direct chemical depiction, the hydrophilic portion is just depicted as a sphere and the hydrophobic portion is the lines for the tails. This forms spherical encapsulations that ultimately can be the outer wall, the outer defense of any cell. And besides forming these structures, an important characteristic is this physical compartmentalization that they allow. So by having this charged barrier, biochemistry can determine what's going to go into and out of a cell. For example, by phosphorylating any molecule, once you have a negative charge on it and your membrane has this negatively charged phosphate layer, those negative charges repel each other. This means that molecule is unlikely to travel across this charged layer into the interior of this 
phospholipid bilayer, and it decreases the solubility in the interior uh, alkane portion of the bilayer, meaning that even if it does get across the charged outer layer, it's unlikely to leave the membrane. Uncharged species, however, can travel across, and so this is a way to facilitate transport in and out of the cell selectively. An example of this in glycolysis and gluconeogenesis is the reaction to form of two three-carbon species to form a six-carbon species, or in reverse, the breakdown of that six-carbon fructose bisphosphate species to form phosphorylated three-carbon species. So in this reaction, despite the fact that the phosphate is not involved in the reaction, it's the opposite end of the three-carbon molecules that are reacting, Phosphate is, phosphorylation is preserved throughout. And this is a motif that is common in biochemistry, a reaction of phosphorylated substrates, even when the phosphate isn't participating in the reaction. And this is commonly explained as a way to retain these molecules inside the cell. As long as they stay phosphorylated, they won't be transported out of the cell. Moving on to chemical roles of phosphate, the most important is energy. ATP, adenosine triphosphate, has this triphosphate, polyphosphate tail attached to it. And this is a high energy chemical. Um, it's probably the most important energetic carrier in all of biology. And as an example of that, um, on any given day, you'll turn over your body weight equivalent in ATP, showing you just how much of it you use. The reason for this is because the energy of that triphosphate can be used to transfer phosphate to other molecules. And this can happen in a number of different ways. You can either just transfer a single phosphate from ATP to some other molecule, or you can actually use this uh, to polymerize ATP into nucleic acids. As an example of how this pays off, once you've transferred a phosphate, in this case we're looking at ribose with a phosphate and a pyrophosphate attached to it, this phosphate can act as a leaving group to promote other chemistry which would otherwise not be favorable. So here I'm showing just the amination of this ribose substrate, which is a step in nucleotide synthesis. And what's happening is that you have nitrogen, uh, the amine, uh, reacting and eliminating pyrophosphate, and then hydrolyzing to form this amino ribose moiety, which goes on in further reactions. This reaction would not happen without that pyrophosphate there, but by cleaving that pyrophosphate bond to the ribose, the energetics of the reaction are favorable, allowing the synthesis to occur. And this type of transfer of phosphorylation to produce favorable energetics is once again used throughout biology to promote other reactions. Phosphate has all of these varied roles in life. You have chemical energy transfer and activation, you have physical compartmentalization, you have structural aspect of nucleic acid backbones and phospholipid bilayers. And it's really hard to think of another chemical moiety that would be able to fulfill all of these roles. Phosphate is just really tidy in how it can just address all of these different needs of the cells. So why wouldn't life use phosphate? And the answer to that is that it's quite scarce. Phosphate is insoluble and unreactive. It tends to be tied up in minerals that are not going to be available for life. And none of these minerals are polyphosphates. So it's not like this energy is already bound up in high energy phosphates that could be used directly by life. And we only know of one pyrophosphate, that's the phosphate dimer mineral. And so it doesn't seem likely that we'd be able to harness this energy directly. So then we would have to rely on soluble phosphates and there's limited geochemical production of these reactive forms. And so this is a problem for incorporation of phosphate before life exists. So with that in mind then, there's these open questions about how life began to use phosphate. When did life begin to use phosphate? Was it there from the beginning or did it come later? If it wasn't there at the very beginning, what came before? What other species and in what role were they incorporated to take over all of these important roles of phosphate in life? Whenever phosphate began being incorporated in life, where did this early phosphate come from?
So if you're interested in these questions, Libre Texts, which is a collection of free online textbooks, has a book called Organic Chemistry with a Biological Emphasis that has an entire chapter on reactions of phosphate. Or you can read about how an early metabolism that didn't involve phosphate could have been formed. Or the journal Life has a special issue entirely about phosphorus and the origins of life. So I would encourage you to check out those res resources. Thank you.